Welcome to the Decode Podcast. Uh, this is a show where we talk all things uh, headless WordPress and modern web development in general. And we're happy to be back uh, with you this week for a new episode. I'm Kellen Mace from the developer relations team at uh, WP Engine. And I'm joined as always by my co-host, Grace Erickson. How's it going, Grace? Great. Super cool. Um, and we are uh, very happy to be on with a great guest this week. And that is Lee Robinson from Vercel. Um, if you are involved at all with um, with this, you know, uh, building decoupled sites and uh, particularly working with Next.js, you probably know who that is. Um, Lee's been doing a lot of, you know, high quality um, content for a number of years. So we're thrilled to have him on to talk about, you know, this this space. So we'll, or sorry. <laughs> so um, uh, thank you so much, Lee, for being on with us. How's it going today? Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Excited to be here and and talk more and it's a great day. I'm about to head out to vacation in, in a couple couple hours after this, so can't complain, really. Very nice. Nice long weekend. Yeah. So to kick things off, Lee, I know you started out in design, um, but can you talk a little bit about how you your like developer origin story and how you ended up in DevRel? Yeah, absolutely. I have a, an interesting backstory to how I've I've got to where I'm at today. So started in design. I actually was debating going to school for being a designer. And I worked at a graphic designer at a, a local company that did, you know, t-shirts and other sorts of other sorts of graphics. And I really liked it. I still love design and it influences a lot of a lot of what I do today. But ultimately I decided to go to school for engineering. I've always always enjoyed computers as well. And I was like, ah, I feel like I can, I feel like I can get a good job with this. Just purely based it on that. I was like, <laughs> so uh, yeah, I, I struggled at first to figure out programming, but then over time it everything started to click and, you know, got a job as a programmer out of college, um, worked in product engineering for many years. And then over time kind of started to realize that what really drove me and inspired me and made it fun to go to work was the creation side and less of the um, the normal product engineering side. So the uh, writing and content creation and helping developers learn and helping them succeed, that was really what got me excited at the end of the day. And then I realized that there's this whole job field for this called DevRel or developer relations and developer advocates. I was like, wow, this is actually very aligned with the stuff that I enjoy doing. And, you know, fast forward a few, few years later and I got into DevRel and today I'm leading the developer relations team at Vercel. Vercel is a, a front end cloud platform for deploying your sites. And I, I lead our DevRel team of currently four um, to create content and grow our community and help help developers succeed with their front ends. Super cool. Um, so you're also super involved with Next.js. Um, obviously, that's one of the most popular front end frameworks out there. Um, and WordPress is a very popular um, CMS. So have you seen a lot of sites that use both Next and WordPress? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the the decoupled uh, headless architecture or separating the concerns of their front end and the back end just seem to continue to rise. And lots of people are choosing Next.js on the front end for that because one, it's built on top of React. A lot of teams like React. And two, it provides some optimizations and tools that make it really easy to build React applications at a large scale. So we've seen a ton of people choose WordPress for their CMS to pair with Next.js because the design and the APIs that Next.js provide make it really easy for you to essentially plug into your existing APIs and your existing, you know, however you wanna access that WordPress data such that there's a clean separation between your front end and your back end. And uh, it makes it pretty easy to pair those two together. Cool. Um, next, we'd love to talk about um, uh, using Kind of building building on top of next, you know, I uh, there's a lot of talk these days um, from from 
uh, you folks at Vercel on building the SDK for the web, you know, and I think I'm always very inspired uh, listening to Guillermo talk every time he's on a podcast or anything. I like, I will be sure to tune in because he seems to have like, uh, he seems to be so like passionate about the web and pushing mm-hmm. things forward and so, and that kind of thing. So, um, so in that, in that vein, like what I, something I've seen, uh, several projects attempt to do is, is take next JS, um, and, uh, and build on top of that to, um, to accomplish different things. So one is, you know, one project, um, that some of our listeners are probably aware of is like blitz JS. And this is a cool mm-hmm. project I've been following for quite some time. You know, Brandon Bayer is the developer behind that. And he's, he's, you know, really like loved working in next, you know, but he, um, wanted like a backend for it instead of calling ex- external APIs. He wanted to kind of like bring his own database and turn it into a full stack framework, you know, so mm-hmm. he paired it with Prisma and Postgres. And now you get this kind of all in one feel, which, um, which is cool. I've been like interested in, uh, what he's been doing with that project for a while. Uh, and then us uh, at WP engine, we've done something similar. Um, and our framework is called Faust JS where we've taken, um, next JS and then layered on top of it, some things, uh, that, that kind of make it tailor made for working with headless WordPress projects. So you're, you're like the data fetching story, you know, hooking things up to, to WP GraphQL. It's, it's all already there. You know, we have some uh, React hooks that you can use for convenience mm-hmm. for grabbing your posts and categories and users or, or whatever types of data. And the data just magically appears, you know, rather than, um, uh, wiring that up from scratch and things. And, um, and I think it's, I, I like that approach. It seems to me like you, you have the benefit of, um, all of the, all of the effort and development hours are poured into next. You can still benefit from those things, you know, but we're, we're, uh, layering on top of it. Some of these, um, extra features that, they kind of give developers a head start. That's the way I view it. You know, it's like, could you do this with a vanilla next JS app? Absolutely. Right. But you would need to wire, wire up the, the data fetching and authentication and post post blog, blog post previews is another thing that you get for free out of the box. So, so that's the thing it, um, it tries to extend next with. So I just love your opinion on, on that. Like, have you seen other projects do that? And you think it's a, you know, viable approach to use next as kind of a platform like that to build things on top of? Yeah, the underlying desire here comes down to individual engineers or individual engineering teams and their level of abstraction desired. So if we start with just React, React gives you these primitives that allow you to make it really easy to build on the web. And that's honestly a pretty pretty low level abstraction. Like if you really Mm -hmm. want to stitch together all that infrastructure, you can. You can set up your own Webpack config. You can set up your own Babel config. That's totally fine. Mm -hmm. Then there have been projects, you know, starting with create React app and then moving to next and and similar solutions that allow you to have a layer of abstraction on top of that to simplify some of the setup. Now, does that mean that people won't choose putting just React as a script tag in their head and just like not even using a framework, like just using the React library on their HTML page. No, no, no. People still do that. And that's totally valid. And same thing with Next.js. In providing that layer of abstraction, there are people who that's going to work really great for them or their team. And they're they're happy with the trade-offs they're making on what the library or framework gives you. Now, there's also Mm -hmm. people who are looking for even more abstraction. They are wanting the um, kind of all-in-one approach where they don't have to think about any decisions. It's everything is bundled together and everything, every piece of the stack has been chosen for them. And that's the highest level of abstraction, right? It's the entire bundled experience. Everything here comes Mm -hmm. together and you can just kind of hit the ground running. And I think the, the cohort of people that have found this really interesting that I've talked to is maybe someone who's a single solo founder trying to build a business who doesn't really want to get into the technical weeds of some things. They would prefer to have a lot of those decisions made for them. And that's what that layer of abstraction really gives to those people is reduces the, uh, the, the decisions they need to make to get their project off the ground. So there's, there's absolutely a place for that too. And I think it's, 
part of my role in, in working with the Next.js community is trying to help developers understand those different options, what the trade-offs are of choosing a yep. vanilla React or choosing a Next.js or choosing an abstraction on top such that they can make the right choice choice for their team. Mm. Yeah, I'm reminded of um, the famous Apple, uh, you know, I think it's a Steve Jobs quote. And I, I, I can't remember exactly how it goes, but it's the, the decisions, not options or decisions over options. Have you all heard that that quote? You know, where Apple like they try to be opinionated, right, and like do the do this, make these decisions ahead of time, so that um, the users of their products uh, don't have you know decision fatigue trying to yep. you know pick pick from you know what's what's easier three three kinds of ice cream you pick one versus we have ninety six flavors that you mm -hmm. might enjoy, and all of a sudden it's like ah, it feels like more work, right? The fact that they yeah. have more to choose from. So next is yeah that can, that. Uh, that sentiment plagued the React ecosystem for a while, where yeah, right. um, React gained so much popularity and people really wanted to use it, but they had 100 flavors of ice cream. And luckily, I think where we're at today in 2021, almost 2022, which is pretty uh, pretty unreal, yeah. uh, is that a lot of that decision fatigue has went away. And the great thing about it, this is very similar to the philosophy that we take at Vercel from a platform perspective, is we want to be opinionated about the tools that we think will help developers succeed while at the same time respecting and understanding that people want to bring their own tools. So mm. you can have this guided out of the box path to success that uses the tools that you recommend while still giving developers or people on your platform the hooks and the means to extend it and bring their tools if they want to do something different. So a good example mm. of this might be maybe the default database that we start recommending is to use a Postgres database. Now, if I don't want to use Postgres, that's okay. You can still use MySQL and we make it easy for them to opt out if they want to. This is actually mm. one of Next.js's core library designs from the start, which was it's built on top of these tools, but if you need to override these tools, we're still gonna let you do that. We're not gonna make it completely uh, completely this black box that you can't customize. So you can yeah. override the Webpack config if you need to, for example. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like Create React App paved the way to some degree with, eject with the concept of ejecting, right? Where you have this, this easy done for you um, kind, of, kind of tool, but could eject if you needed to. But uh, that that seemed like a you know a situation where you you would need to manually maintain everything after eject, ejecting. Whereas I I think my my impression of next is that um, it's a little more what's the word like plug and play or something like you, if you opt out of one part then you're yep. still getting still getting the the prepackaged opinions made for you you know yeah. um, benefits of the other parts. That was one of the designs that we didn't want to do from Create React App, which was yeah. the eject model. Um, yeah. Because now there are, I forget what it's called. It's like CRACO or like Cracko or something, which is like Create React App, but you can override it without ejecting. So it's, okay. it's trying to bring that same thing to Create React App because you want to keep updating and get library updates, but mm -hmm. you still need to extend it with something. Right. Yeah. Very, very interesting. Um, I'd love to uh, uh, take a little tangent here, and that is to um, just talk about like we, we mentioned Apple once already. I, I brought it up, and one thing that brought to mind for me is um, uh, when I tune in for NextConf. You know, it's like the the production quality is like is so high compared to a lot of you know technical conferences and things like that. And it reminds me very much these days of of some Apple keynotes. You know, with with Johnny Ive, you know, waxing poetic about purity of design and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And that, um, you know, Vers Versailles, I get similar vibes, like listening to, to uh, you know, Guillermo um, talk about like the web and where it's, where it's been and where it's headed and so on, which is super interesting to me. I think he, draw he uh, draws a lot of like inspiration from, from Apple. One interesting thing I heard him say on a recent, um, in a recent interview is that like the one thing he doesn't want to, to emulate uh, uh, from Apple is the closed source nature. 
you know, he, he likes a lot of, a mm. lot of what, what they do, the whole, you know, e- ethos and, um, and, uh, decisions, not options, all that stuff we talked about. He likes mm-hmm. all of that, but then how, you know, the, the whole walled garden idea and every, everything's closed source. That's where he draws the line. He's like, no, you know, for, yep. for us, our, our frameworks and our, our platform, we're all about the open web, you know, and he seems very passionate about that. So do you feel the same? Like, what are your thoughts, yeah. thoughts there? Oh yeah. I mean, I agree fully when you think about it, the web is an app store and there's yeah. no, there's no single entity that controls access to it. There's no walled garden of uh, leaderboards or app stores or places to download these things. It's just it's just the open the open web and the open internet, and that's super empowering for people trying to build their business online, people trying to connect all across the world. So being able to build tools for the web platform and an open platform is very inspiring and uplifting for me as somebody working in the space. Uh, I still, I still think mobile apps are awesome and they have a lot of traction too. And a lot of people use them. It's just a different, uh, a different set of trade-offs with the type of people that you can connect with. People have to go Mm -hmm. through the effort to have the device. They have to go to the app store. They have to install that app versus the barrier to entry. It's kind of one of our, our goals and missions at Vercel is to lower the barrier of entry and the barrier to entry of opening a URL for you know the majority of the world having access to internet connection now and more and more every day it's it's right. it's great it really enables so much so many more people to be online and be connected yeah um what do you think of uh, progressive web apps you know a lot of people for for years um were were you know heralding progressive web apps as like the app store of the web right where you could you still have this very easy on ramp where you can go go to any site directly without installing anything or going to an app store and that's great but if it's something you go to often and maybe you want you know pages cached for offline viewing or whatever other features well mm-hmm. then great you can save it to your home screen and you know it um has a lot of these app like features and as you know as as you and many of our listeners know that that you know uh, gap between what the uh, capabilities, you know, an, an app on your mobile device might have and what web apps have is just getting like lower and lower all the time. A lot of these mm-hmm. APIs that, that the web has access to now. So, yeah. Yeah. Specifically on, uh, on PWAs, like, I think there's a lot of good ideas there, especially around service workers too. Um, yeah. And as you mentioned, like as the number of native browser APIs increases to allow some of the functionality that you might have to jump to an app for, it just continues to to close that gap where, sure, it might not be the the native app experience where it feels like it's it's running on your device, but it gets pretty close. And, you know, Mm -hmm. it really depends on the the type of app you're building. But for a lot of things that can actually be, that can actually be a better choice. Um, It's kind of funny Mm -hmm. because something that the web has been able to do forever, which is, I deploy a new version of my site and everybody can see it is something yeah. that the app store is, you know, just catching up to maybe not just, but it's, it's hard to do progressive updates for a mobile app. You know, mm-hmm. the, the app stores want to have a review process. They want to make sure that you're safely introducing new versions. And there mm-hmm. are the concept of like over the air updates where you can push, push these updates that I, I think, my take is that they're kind of frowned on, frowned upon, it seems like, by Apple and Google um, hmm. because they want the review process. But then you look at the web, it's like, yeah, that's just how it works. Like the over-the-air update is I, I push a new update and it's live. And I, maybe I'm doing hmm. an A-B test or something. But like in general, I have the ability to push a new update when something's broke or when something needs an update. Like that whole set of constraints on how you actually deliver your code to your, to your customers is, uh, much different in mobile world than web world. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love that idea. Just, just being a web developer and working on the web, you know, it's so empowering for me to think about like, oh, if I, you know, if I, um, have a small startup or somebody like me has some, you know, small company and they don't have the engineering resources to have somebody building out a Swift app and a Kotlin app and a web client and whatever else, like, these mm-hmm. days you can do, do so much, particularly with JavaScript, right? With, you know, yep. technologies like, like Electron and um, Ionic and all these uh, kinds of frameworks um, mm-hmm. and React, React Native and so on. Like you can, 
you can really do a lot of this stuff. It's, uh, it's so, so cool and empowering to me. Um, well, I want to switch gears a little bit with you, uh, um, Lee, and talk uh, a little about um, Next JS twelve. So first off, like congrats to you, Vercel, all the you know contributors um, who m made that happen. Like Next JS is just on a crazy you know rocket rocket ship ride at this point. It's um, it's, um so popular and uh, and much beloved as well. Uh, one of the particularly cool features I think is uh, the introduction of middleware. Mm. Um, so can you you know, just give folks like a, a, you know, brief elevator pitch for, uh, what middleware is, you know, what that allows you to do and maybe a common use case or two there. Yeah, basically, you know, we heard from people in the Next.js community that they wanted some of the flexibility that they had when they were using an express server. And the big thing in that ecosystem was being able to just install NPM install these plugins that allowed you to easily add more functionality to your backend. And what we kind of realized was it was possible to do with Next.js, but it wasn't as easy as it should be. So mm -hmm. we stepped back and we thought about how can we enable developers more control over the entire life cycle of a request? So a request comes in, yeah. some logic can happen, and the request goes out and some logic could happen there too. And the abstraction that we came up with is called middleware, which essentially allows you to target some or all of the pages and routes in your application and run some mm. code before or after that request happens. So you got a request yeah. and a response and you can, you can access those things and, and do some logic to them. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a little vague because there is a lot that you can do there. So to contextualize it and to give examples, I would say probably the most common things are around A-B testing, feature flags, personalization, server-side analytics, um, things in that nature where, yeah. for example, let's say I put a middleware in front of my entire application and mm -hmm. I want to do A-B testing. A request comes in, it talks to our A-B testing service. It says, hey, based on a cookie or a session, this user is part of this experiment or this A-B test. So mm -hmm. let's rewrite them to the new version of this page instead of the old version. And the key thing here is you might hear that and think, okay, well, that was possible before, right? And the answer is yes, but there are some trade-offs before that made it difficult to achieve that. So if you were doing client-side experimentation or client-side A-B testing, mm -hmm. you would have this experience where your customer would load the page they might see you know, a white screen or they might see the layout of a specific page. And then once that logic or that JavaScript runs to determine if they're in the experiment or they're in the A-B test, right. and yeah. all of a sudden it flips on them, right? And that's, that's a poor user experience. And then yeah. if you're trying to do all of that logic with server-side rendering, um, that could also potentially have issues because you're essentially in an all or nothing situation where you're waiting for that entire thing, that entire process of determining whether the user is, is in the experiment or not to finish before you display anything to the user. So again, now yeah. instead, of a, instead of a client side loading screen or a client side uh, shift, now you're looking at the browser loading spinner, which is equally right. not as great. So <laughs> wait, wait now or wait later. Yeah, exactly. yeah. So to, to solve both of those, we really think that one, the abstraction of middleware is key. And two, we believe a lot in edge functions, which is something that we're, uh, we released at our conference uh, on the Vercel platform, which is trying to help eliminate some of the trade-offs that folks might have had with serverless architectures and also make it a lot more feasible to do what I just talked about and still fall into uh, a situation where you're repeatedly and consistently having good performance. Mm -hmm. And so tell me if I understand this properly, like for the example of AB testing, um, it seems, what seems powerful to me is to be able to pair uh, the middleware feature and the ability to do AB testing with um, the incremental static regeneration or ISR feature of next, right? So the way I'm envisioning this is a request comes in and this person is in, you know, cohort A or whatever they should get you know, experience A. Um, so that request request comes in, a static version of the page is generated and served to that person. 
person B comes in, same thing happens. The static version is, you know, served to that person. And then from that point on, you would have two, you know, statically built versions of that same page, but both would still abide by the, um, you know, re revalidate, you know, number of seconds that you've established for those static pages and just, you know, on in the background next would refresh both. Is that how that would work out? Yeah, exactly. That's why when we, we talk to customers who are trying to implement this type of logic, we describe it as you can still have dynamic at the speed of static. You don't have to sacrifice mm. the product requirements for having experimentation or having custom personalization based on that user while also getting the speed benefits that you want from static. And I think for a lot of teams, when they made that move to static, they lost a lot of that stuff to try to get yeah. the benefits of a, a fully static site, which there are lots of benefits. Right. And I think now what we're trying to provide is, you know, you can have both and we're going to help enable you to have both. Yeah. Oh, very cool. So one thing you touched on that I'd love to dive into more deeply is um, edge functions. You know, that mm -hmm. was another, another recent uh, exciting addition um, to, you know, the capabilities that, that next and that Vercel offer. Um, so edge functions uh, are exciting to me. This is, you know, I, I come from a, a background of like a traditional server rendered, you know, monolithic web development using, um, using WordPress. And many of our listeners, I think, are in the same boat. You know, mm -hmm. so for them, they're used to the idea of like the, the edge is the, the buzzword du jour, you know, for, for this kind of thing. Yes. And, uh, you know, historically, like I think myself and our, our listeners, you know, we've used for ages a content delivery network or CDN, which can take, you know, statically generated, uh, ver you know, um, versions of pages on your site, as well as assets like images and so on, and spread those across, you know, to data centers across the globe so that they're at the edge or close to your, your users, right? So that's been around for ages, but it seems like now we're in this new era where you, you can have, you know, uh, compute or you can have actual logic running. Uh, you can do some work, um, at the mm -hmm. edge as well, and even make decisions on that. So for, you know, if your data center, if your origin server is, is in the, the, the US, let's say, and you have some visitor from uh, Japan, for instance, um, the request can come into the data center, you know, it, it, in Tokyo or wherever they may be located, and then you can make some decisions. You can say what request headers are in this person's request, or, you know, what, what do we, what should we serve this person? And then serve up a different version of the page to that person. And you never have to do this whole like circumnavigate the globe, yeah. you know, and phone home, phone home to the origin server to make these kinds of decisions. You're able to, to run some logic at the edge. So I'm really um, excited about like, like our, uh, our frenemies over at Cloudflare are doing some like really interesting stuff with, with workers and uh, their KV storage stuff is like pretty, pretty re remarkable to me. Um, and then uh, Netlify as well has similar, you know, ed edge functions. Um, mm -hmm. So, it, you know, uh, can you like compare, compare those maybe, you know, if you're yep. familiar with some of those offerings from, from com competitors and what, you know, Vercel's um, offering looks like? Yeah, yeah, for sure. First, maybe just to reemphasize your point, because you, you did mm -hmm. a great job of explaining why this exists right now. Just to even take it back a little bit further to paint the picture of why this stuff even exists. It's like, sure, yeah. You know, if we, if we go back even further to single database, single origin server, and I'm doing at the time, you know, basically everybody just did server rendering. Like there wasn't mm. client side rendering, wasn't really a thing that people did. Yeah. So you make a request to a page, you goes to your server, you get new information. It comes back. Great. Right. Then a lot of these really large web experiences that start getting built that have a global customer base say, hey, it's actually kind of slow to go around the world and face the speed of light to try to go fetch this information. Mm -hmm. It'd be great if we could put this stuff closer to customers as close as possible, ideally. And right. that's really where, like you mentioned, the CDNs came in or the content delivery networks where it was caching that information closer to the users. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem with that while, while it brought a lot of benefits in speed, it was a trade-off you were making to lose some of the flexibility that you get by being able to go back to your database and recompute stuff on every request. And that's really where this 
you know, somewhat nebulous term of edge or edge network came in, which yeah. was like, hey, we still want to host static assets at an edge node, but mm -hmm. we also want to be able to run compute or run some code there too. And that, in my head, that's the distinction between a CDN or when someone says they have an edge network. So like for cell, for example, we have an edge network because yeah. you can host the static stuff and, and run the compute. So that starts to make a bit more sense to me when I think about the history to where we've evolved to say, okay, now that I can run that compute at the edge, I can get mm -hmm. a little bit of both of what I was trying to do there. I can still have my static assets there, but if I need to compute something, I can do it at the at the server or at the edge in Japan, in Tokyo, right, yeah. and then go directly back to, to the customer. Um, so they're stateful, essentially. So how we compare, I guess, to other solutions in the ecosystem. On one hand, you have um, expert mode, which is like building a globally distributed, you know, globally replicated database uh, across every single region in the world, which can work really well, but it's mm. uh, potentially expensive, poten potentially hard to set up. Mm. Uh, and then on the other hand, you have services like Vercel's edge functions that are making it easier for customers to adopt this technology where it's co-located with your code. Mm -hmm. So when I'm in my, my Next.js or my Svelte kit or really whatever front-end framework I want to use, I'm able to use this concept of middleware right now on, on Vercel and get it deployed as an edge function as part of the same action of deploying mm -hmm. my website. It's not a separate system. It's not a separate process. It's all just your code. Take your code and put it out into the world in the best infrastructure possible. So fun fact, actually under the hood, uh, our current design of edge functions is basically designed around the JavaScript VA engine and VA isolates. And so it's not Node.js. Okay. Uh, and it's based around how can we use the web platform to its fullest? How can we take advantage of web APIs that all modern browsers know and understand and use? So because of those constraints, we're very aligned with like the Cloudflare workers of the, of the world. And mm -hmm. the, the version that we're using right now in Vercel is actually built on top of Cloudflare workers. No so, way. Yeah. It blew my mind. I did not yes. know that. Huh. <laughs> yeah. So for, for all the people who've tried workers and they know what that experience is like, it's yeah. essentially taking all the, the good things about workers, their, you know, their great infrastructure. We really like the Cloudflare team and mm -hmm. there's, there's many very smart engineers there. And we're taking that and we're putting the Vercel developer experience, the de developer, uh, like the design of our, of our product and integrating yeah. it directly into all of these front end frameworks to make it really easy to use. Um, so I like to think of the Vercel platform kind of as, I like to think of it as like the best parts of multi-cloud. You deploy your app and we're going to find the best infrastructure possible for you and you mm -hmm. don't have to think about it. So if that's a Lambda function on AWS, we'll do that. If it is mm -hmm. a static HTML page, we'll globally propagate those to every single edge in our network. If it is an edge function, we'll use Cloudflare under the hood to help uh, cr you know, create these functions at every single edge in our network. So... Mm -hmm. We try to give customers the best possible infrastructure all the time. Very cool. Um, Vercel also recently announced that Rich Harris will be joining the company to work on Svelte full time. Um, before that announcement, did you view Svelte Kit as a competitor to Next, or like how did you feel about it? Yeah, I'm I'm very excited that that Rich is joining the company. We just got back from Svelte Summit actually this past weekend, where I got to meet Rich and uh, meet a lot of people in the Smelt community. And there's there's so much love and excitement around Svelte and Svelte Kit. So I'm, I'm very excited that we're able to support him and support that open source project and help it grow. Um, as to your question about Next and Svelte Kit being competitors, I would say they're largely inspired by each other uh, and have a lot of similar ideas. And at the end of the day, um, there is a cohort of people who are anti-React, I guess, that yeah. just uh, they just don't like React. And whether that's their 
Um, whether that's their syntax preference or whether it's the way React hooks work or whatever other reason that is, a lot of these type of people are really enjoying using Svelte. And Svelte Kit specifically takes a lot of the ideas that Next.js does and brings them to the Svelte world. So I view it less as a competitor and, and more of a, when Svelte Kit succeeds, Next.js succeeds. And it, really the web as a whole succeeds. Yeah, to me, it, um, uh, before that announcement, you know, I, I would have viewed um, SvelteKit or, or Nuxt or, uh, or Gatsby or other options out there as, as competitors to Next.js and, you know, competitor, I guess, is in air quotes, because we're talking about open source projects here, right? Like, yeah. um, however, there is the whole positioning aspect of like, if someone's building a Next app, it, it may seem very logical in, 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 in their mind to host with Versal, the company backing the project, right? Those two are, you know, uh, two peas in a pod, so to speak. Um, mm -hmm. So now, you know, now with uh, Svelte, like I like Svelte a lot um, personally, and now with Rich coming on board, it, it's, it feels kind of like a rising tide lifts all boats kind of situation. You know, I, I can just picture mm -hmm. like, you know, asking, posing the question to, to yourself or Guillermo, Guillermo or leadership there saying like, well, if someone chooses next or if they choose Svelkit, how do you feel? And they're like, cool, man. What do you like? Like yeah. we can, we can, we can handle it. We can uh, support you. So, mm -hmm. so that choice is, is very cool. Um, I want to ask you like, how do you think that change will affect the future of the Svelte project? So um, I gave a talk at, at Svelte Summit uh, last, mm -hmm. last week, uh, the conference you mentioned on, you know, pairing SvelteKit with uh, headless, headless WordPress and building, you know, apps with that kind of architecture. And, um, and I tuned in myself for the conference as well. And I, you know, on several occasions, um, both Guillermo and Rich made comments to the effect that like, oh yeah, now that this partnership has been made and I'm coming on board, we can do more interesting things with SvelteKit, mm -hmm. right? So for me, I'm just like, you know, uh, wondering, dying to know more. <laughs> what do you mean? What are these interesting things? Yeah. So, what do you think? What, what secrets can you spill for us, Lee? Yeah. Well, the, <laughs> I think the first secret to spill is not really a secret at all, which is people have valid concerns when they hear something like this. They're like, well, the Svelte project that I love, I don't want that to, I don't want that to change. I don't want that open source community to go away. And that's something from people like myself all the way up to Guillermo and the entire company. Like, we don't want that either. We don't want to come in yep. and take over that project and, and affect the community. Our goal really in, by hiring Rich and empowering him to, to work on this project full-time is to give Spelt its first full-time contributor and, and maintainer um, who can dedicate their, their whole hours to it. Because it's kind of incredible how yep. far Rich got when it wasn't even his full-time job. I mean, I he, agree. <laughs> he built a, an amazing community around this right. um, with yeah. incredible tech. Uh, and, and great people. So mm -hmm. I think that's like, that's the number one thing. But then when I look to the future and to do more interesting things, uh, yeah. I think one thing that I'm really excited about that Vercel is trying to do is, and I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but is just give everyone the best possible infrastructure. When I deploy my application, I don't care if it's Next.js. I don't care if it's Svelte. I don't care if it is Remix. I don't care what new framework comes out. I mm -hmm. want to use the best infrastructure and I want it to be fast and I want to not have to think about the DevOps type stuff. Yeah. Um, so what we've been working on is making sure our platform works great for every single framework and mm -hmm. working with framework offers, authors to make it such that when you deploy their favorite project to Vercel, it just works zero config. You don't have to do anything all the options get pre-configured for you and you don't have to set anything up. So mm -hmm. SvelteKit is actually already this way. You can deploy SvelteKit and it, it just works. Um, mm -hmm. We're working with the Remix team on this just yet today, actually. I think, oh, we're, very cool. I think we're getting close there. So you'll be able to deploy Remix things. Same with like, we're working with the Astro team on this. That's very close. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Nux and Vue and Create React app and all the other things that you might be wanting to use. They, they all work, zero config. So we want to make that experience for every possible framework, as well as the new ones that are coming out. So mm -hmm. looking towards the future of Spell in particular, we're building out a lot of infrastructure to help developers run code at the edge and use things like edge functions. 
So I think it'll be really fascinating to pair the amazing performance that you get from Svelte with edge functions as well too, to kind of take that to the next level. Yeah. Um, how about, uh, how about something like, um, Next.js live, you know, I, I remember, um, tuning in for next conf when that was, uh, introduced and thinking like, man, I, my, my idea of what next next is and, and Vercel is, you know, one being an open source JavaScript platform and the other being, um, a hosting platform is like morphing, you know, with that, yeah. with that chain, with the, the multiplayer collaborative edit, Google doc style collaboration yeah. stuff. Um, it's, it's, you know, quite cool stuff. So do you envision something like that, you know, coming to Spellkit? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So with next live, like maybe a more clear description of it would have been Vercel live that works for Next.js because a lot of it, you know, you need to use right. the Vercel platform, right? Like you can deploy right, your right. Next.js or you can, you can collaborate on your Next.js app mm -hmm. and work with your entire team and run it directly in the browser. And to do that, we had to kind of overhaul the whole engine that runs Next.js to work just on the web standards, essentially, right? So mm -hmm. when you look at that and you think about, okay, this, this technology can be used for anything, it's super exciting. Imagine a world where there's Svelte Live and for, or Vercel Live for Svelte. And I want to collaborate with my team on my Svelte project. I go to the mm -hmm. browser, I open it up, I can edit the code directly and then I press a button, it commits to Git or it deploys instantly. And that's a world yep. that we can, we can and are working towards. Yeah. That's, that's stuff like that is amazing. And like the, um, uh, stack blitz, do I have the name, right? Stack yeah. blitz, blitz project, or like running your, your whole IDE in the browser, mm -hmm. stuff like that, uh, is, uh, very impressive to me. Um, uh, I love, I'd love to know like your, um, personal opinion of Svelte Like if you, if this is Lee Robinson, not as a, you know, rep for, for Vercel or whatever, this is Lee Robinson, like on the weekend, I'm hacking away on a code project, you know, mm -hmm. would you pick, um, Svelte Kit in certain circumstances or are mm -hmm. you like dyed in the wool next JS is where it's at, you mm -hmm. know, How, what, what do you think personally, uh, like of the two? Yeah. I mean, my personal take is that I'm extremely familiar with React and yes. Next.js. I mean, I've been using React since 2015. I know all the good parts and all the bad parts. Mm -hmm. And I've been using Next.js since like 2017, I think. And I know all the good parts and all the bad parts. And I'm, I'm very comfortable with that. So anytime I'm building something, I usually pick the tool that I, I know best. But I have had a good amount of time now to actually start trying to build things with Svelte kit and mm -hmm. Steph on my team, who's a developer advocate. She was at Svelte summit and she's making lots of content on, on Svelte. You know, mm -hmm. I get to work with her and review the stuff that she's creating. And she has a really great video on YouTube where, um, she builds like a, I like a Apple music or a iTunes search app. And I watched that video and like, it kind of finally just clicked for me. The, uh, the amount of code that you don't have to write. Like I'd read the yeah. docs, I'd built some smaller apps. I hadn't really built anything large with Svelte Kit. And I watched that video and I, and I thought about all of the React hooks I've wrote in my life. And I was like, okay, I can see the appeal of this. Like I can mm -hmm. see how this is really, really beneficial. Mm -hmm. And I do think that those ideas, like if you remember in the, back in the beginning of React with React class components, you had a lot mm -hmm. of code. Yep. And then React Hooks, it was like, let's write less code and make it a little bit easier. And then right. Svelte, it's like, let's write even less code. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so I do think that Svelte, you know, was influenced by React. And now I think React is also going to be influenced by Svelte. So there's a lot mm -hmm. of good stuff there. Yeah. I built that's, the uh, that's very cool. I built the the official Svelte kit example on Vercel. It's like a, oh, cool. it's a pretty, it's a pretty simple app. It just like looks at the SpaceX API and then displays some things, but it was enough for me to, to understand how things work and to feel confident about it. Oh, very cool. I, um, so I worked with both, both as well. And like the, the feeling I get from each is, is, um, when I'm working in react, I feel like I'm writing JavaScript that, you know, will, will, will output or result in HTML, 
you know, whereas felt feels like it's coming from the other direction. It's like, I feel like I'm writing HTML, you know, and it has that back to the jQuery mm -hmm. days and the, the talk of like sprinkling in interactivity. I kind of get that vibe where it's like, it feels like a super set of HTML, you know, it's mm -hmm. been kind of, kind of enhanced in some ways. And as the, the scope styles baked in and, you know, some of the conveniences and stuff that it offers, but. Mm -hmm. Another good thing to talk yeah. about too, on that is like, I do like SvelteKit, but it also isn't 1.0 yet. So it's true. So Svelte, the, the library or the compiler is stable, but SvelteKit, the project still is being iterated on and worked on. So I try yeah. to, I try to remember that too, because it's very fun for me to work with, but when I'm giving recommendations to like some of our customers, I have yep. to help make sure that I have that nuance, which is Next.js, which is fairly widely used at this point, um, especially in production being used. And a lot of those bugs and edge cases, corner cases have been, have been worked through. It's also something mm -hmm. to consider too, when you're comparing against each other, but it's just a matter of time before Svelte gets to, to 1.0 and really takes off. So at this moment, would you ever recommend Svelte Kit over next or no? Um, I would say like today, if I'm trying to build an app that I don't want to, I want to include the most minimal amount of JavaScript possible. Those are the constraints that I'm given. A lot of times React is a non-starter for that. It's just, it's just not, it's not the way to do it. Yes, you can disable JavaScript and like sprinkle some in on top or, you know, use uh, some of the newer React frameworks that are trying to like um, do the progressive um, islands, islands yeah, architecture, islands architecture. And sure. it's like, yes, that works. But I, I think that Svelte's already there. So I think for those type of uh, those type of requirements, I think that's where I would recommend Svelte today. Um, can you envision a future where Svelte Kit like gets more attention from Vercel's engineering department than Next? Maybe <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I feel like Next uh, Next will probably uh, continue to be the main framework that we contribute to as far as putting um, engineers who work on it full time. There is a world though where we uh, we we help support the. Svelte and Svelte Kit projects more. Like maybe we hire more people who want to contribute to Svelte Kit and help see that project grow. It's going to be interesting to see the the development there because it's already grown quite a bit, and I think the next year will be a a, a year of big growth for Svelte. I think so too. Yeah, um, we were on a call, uh, Grace and I, with somebody internally uh, talking about you know um, these JS frameworks recently and. And uh, somebody's asking about like, well, couldn't there be a, a mig? Uh, it started with like a migration path from from one to the other. If somebody wanted to, you know, was interested in switching, and then it and then the conversation went to like, well, could they merge at some point? Mm -hmm. You know, and then when that question was yeah. posed, I was like, but they're so different. You know, React like doing it, oh, yeah. doing it, to, doing its VDOM diffing and determining what needs to you know be updated and then updating it with its browser runtime. Whereas, you know, Svelte is this compiler that, you know, bakes the manual DOM manipulation stuff into your code ahead of time. It's, I'm like, I'm trying to picture how, you know, could you have a world where you're, you're doing both? It yeah. seems, uh, seems wild. <laughs> yeah. That was probably the most common question I got, which is like, oh, really? oh is, is Vercel like gonna like, mer like merge Svelte directly into Next.js and then get rid of Svelte? Like, no, 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 no. Like, yeah. That's not what we want to do. We don't want to like absorb that or anything. And it's not like we're going to make, yeah. we're not going to make Next.js accept Svelte files either. Like that probably, that probably won't happen either. But mm. what's interesting is imagine a world where React is a compiler. Imagine a world where instead of having to ever think about memoization or um, the some of the more advanced React topics that are just due to the way React is built today, what if they were automatically figured out for you and automatically solved? I think that's something like that is maybe more aligned with the future of, of where React and, and Next.js are going, which you know yeah. a lot of that is inspired by some of the decisions that Svelte has made. Um, so I don't Mm -hmm. I don't think there will be any any way where they merge or where you use spelt with next or you use yeah. you know a next JS thing there, but definitely the best parts of both will help grow each other.
Mm-hmm. Very nice. Uh, that sounds like a, a nice note to leave off on, Lee. So um, yeah, I think we can wrap things up. Um, but yeah, we just want to thank you so much for your time, for coming on. It's been fun to talk about um, modern JS frameworks and the web and, uh, and um, you know, what we're, what we're doing here, which is like using Next as a, as a base, as I said, but layering on functionality mm-hmm. for, for use with headless WordPress to, you know, ease that and give developers, um, you know, an extra head start and so on. So it's been really mm-hmm. great to pick your brain on some of this stuff. Um, thank yeah. you so much. And uh, thanks everyone for listening uh, to this episode. Uh, be sure to tune in to the next one and we'll see you then. Thank you both for having me.